Hello, Internet. My name is Quinn, and this is Blondie Hacks. Well, it's been a long time. <laughs> Two plus years uh, of working towards this moment. Today, we are going to get my Pennsylvania A3 Switcher locomotive running on air for the first time. And there's going to be a lot of work to do uh, before we get there, but you will see it in this video. And, well, you'll see the real-world process of how this gets done. And there isn't some grand moment with angels singing and fireworks where you build this thing and everything comes together and it works perfectly and it's amazing. Uh, the real life of building models like this, it's a grind. It's, you know, testing things, modifying things, making things a little better, testing them again, and so on. So uh, I'll try to make that as interesting as possible to watch. <laughs> so let's go. All right, I have one rolling road. I have one locomotive. Now I just need to make a few fittings and such to get this thing connected up to air so we can test it and start tuning things. First thing I need to do is set the pistons. Currently the pistons are in an arbitrary position inside the cylinders and I need to make sure that the travel distance on them is correct or rather that the position within their travel is correct to be more accurate. Right now the pistons at front dead center are sitting about 60 thousandths shy of the head and that is definitely not enough head clearance. The goal is to have the same amount of clearance at each end because of course steam engines are double acting, so there's a power stroke happening at each end on every rotation, and so you need the same amount of thermal gas expansion space at each end. So I put the pistons now at back dead center and I measure that distance, and then with a little bit of math we can figure out what the clearance is at the inside because of course we can't measure it's inside the back head, but we know the length of the bore, we know the thickness of the piston, so a little bit of math tells us where the piston needs to be at back dead center to make the two distances the same. I adjust this by threading the piston in or out of the crosshead, going a little bit at a time and taking measurements and doing the math. The math tells me that I need 130 thousandths of clearance at each end, so I measure the head end because that's easy, and then I measure the far end with the math until I'm as close as I can get. I managed to get within a thousandth, so that's a good sign. Another good sign is that the drain port on the front is now exposed, which it was not before. Those drain ports are important for when there's condensed water in the cylinders. The piston needs to be able to push it out. While I'm in here, I'll get a bunch of oil in everywhere. We're going to be running it for a while on compressed air. And of course, the steam lubrication system is not in place yet, so everything is going to be running dry. I'm also going to lubricate all the running gear, make sure everything's got some startup oil. On the subject of piston volume, people always ask, well, what about the volume occupied by the piston rod on the back side of the piston? And the answer is that just doesn't matter. It's not enough to make a difference. Next, I need a way to connect the compressed air to the steam input line. This is what would connect to the boiler. I've got this silicone tube on my low pressure regulator for my air compressor. So I want to make a little fitting for that. And then on the underside of this, there's an opening that needs to be plugged. That's for the steam oil injector system, which we don't have yet. So that'll just be a big old air leak. So given those two tasks, I sketched out a couple of fittings that should do the job. I'm going to need a hose barb adapter for the steam fitting, and I'll make a little cap to cover up the injector port. Over to the lathe for that. It's not a steam project unless you're making plumbing fittings at some point. I've made a lot of steam engines, and I've run a lot of steam engines on air, and I don't think I have ever once had the same adapter work twice on two different engines. You just end up needing to make a custom something every single time. And this one will go in a drawer when I'm done with it, and I will never use it again somehow. Even though there's only so many threads in the world, and there's always a threaded fitting, somehow, never the same fitting twice. When I die, I'm going to have a Viking funeral with my body laid on a pyre made of one-off steam fittings that I kept because I was sure someday I would use it again, right? This first fitting gets a thread at the bottom for the steam tee, and then I'm going to put a little barb at the top for that hose to hook onto. It's not much of a barb, it's really more of a Linda or a Janus, but it works in HR, I know that much, and it'll get the job done. Always chamfer your hexes, because of course chamfers are what separate us from the animals. We'll Yahtzee that off of there and move on to the next one. The second fitting is even simpler. It's a blind cap that will thread on over top of where the steam oil injector will someday live. 
and plug up that giant steam leak that currently exists at the bottom of the T. For test purposes, I'm trying to make everything as airtight as I can because any air that's being wasted out of the system is air that isn't going into the engine and thus might mislead me as to how well or how not well the engine is running. The amount of pressure and volume of air that the engine consumes tells you a lot about how well it's running and whether things are too tight or too loose and so on. And Yahtzee. There's my two fittings. I took a little time to make them extra nice because I'm sure I'll use them many more times in the future. The little cap goes on underneath the steam tee. I'm putting Loctite 545 on everything. As I said, I want to make sure everything is sealed up nice and tight. Don't want any air leaks if I can help it for this testing. That's what that looks like underneath if you're curious. Then that Janus fitting for the airline goes on top. As I said earlier, this is a simple silicone tube up to about 20 psi. Silicone tubing is just fine for testing and it's a lot easier and less hassle than full-blown airline with the braid sheaths and the coatings and the special fittings and all that. Airline is a real pain in the butt, so don't use it if you don't have to. And while the compressor is warming up, I'll give everything a little bit of oil. Make sure everything that moves has at least some oil in it. This is a basic 30 weight pin and bearing oil. Standard stuff for steam engines. Okay, here we go. Let's light the fires and kick the tires. I'm going to start at 5 psi and ease the pressure up and just see how much pressure it needs to run. First time putting air in this thing. Pretty nervous. A little more pressure. And it's a little stiff. I can feel it wanting to go. Sorry for the compressor noise in this bit. I didn't want to reshoot this because I want you to see the authentic very first run on air. Oh, oh, there it goes, there it goes. Look at that, it's a runner. You can't hear it over the compressor noise, I know, but I'll give you a lot more looks and listens of it here in a minute. But it runs, this is the first authentic official running of this locomotive on air. Very exciting. Now, there are some issues. It's using way too much air, first and foremost. You probably noticed also that it wasn't self-starting very well. It's another sign of there being issues, and it's using somewhere between 15 and 20 PSI, which is really too much, I think. So things are too tight, first of all, and I think there's probably some valve timing issues. But it does run, and that's pretty awesome. So this is a good starting point. We need to do some testing and tuning and refining, but it runs. I ran it like this for a while to see if it would loosen up a little bit, if it would run in a bit, but it really didn't. As you can see, it's using somewhere around 13, 14 PSI. And after I ran it for a while, it would get tighter over time. Like it would be loose for a little bit and then tighten up and then loose for a bit and then tighten up. So there's something fishy going on. It's also using a lot of air, like so much air that my compressor can't keep up. It's not a very big compressor, but still. It's using an enormous amount of air, far more than it should. Let's test the reversing gear while I'm here. I'll move these both to the up position and see if it runs backwards. And look at that, it does. That's pretty cool. It's not going to run that way for very long because without the reversing gear lever holding those linkages in the up position, Gravity is kind of making them drift downward. As you can see, it was sort of hooking up its own gear in reverse there, but, but it does run in reverse, so that's kind of awesome. I thought I'd try it without the rolling road, because actually the rolling road was adding quite a bit of resistance. So it does run noticeably better without that. I made a whole speech about how important rolling roads are, but um, I'm a little bit disillusioned with mine. It's also very noisy. All right, time to start diagnosing. The mechanism is overall too tight. So the first thing I did is I disconnected the pistons, and after that, now it rolls very, very easily. It should roll freely with just the weight of the chassis on those flanges. 
Now, if I reconnect the pistons, however, things get all tight again. Here you can see as I push it, the wheels are dragging and catching and not rolling freely. So the pistons being connected introduces the source of drag, which doesn't necessarily mean it's the pistons themselves. It could be the interaction between the pistons and the crossheads, or the gland nuts, or the rings, or lots of different things. So the first thing I tried was loosening up the crosshead guide rails, because I did have some trouble with those once before, but that didn't make any difference. It's definitely not the crossheads this time, but it is somehow related to the pistons being connected. So the next thing I did was I pulled out the gland packing nuts from the piston rods, and all of a sudden everything loosened right up again. So 90% of the problem seems to be the gland packing nuts. That's good news, that's fairly easy to fix. These guys here are held in by these little set screws, and as you can see, if I just remove them from the mechanism, then everything moves very freely. This is an aspect of Kozo's design that I don't really love. These packing nuts rely on these little set screws to hold them in place, and there isn't really a perfect sweet spot, because if you tighten them too much, it compresses the gland nuts onto the piston rods and makes them tight, but if the set screws aren't tight enough, then the gland nuts slide out. They're not being properly retained. Just using friction that way to hold these in really doesn't seem to work very well, and I couldn't get a sweet spot where everything moved freely without falling apart. And remember, those packing nuts have to hold compressed graphited yarn in there as well. They're, they have to do more than just sit there. My solution for this was to take a drill and a pin vise and hand drill a little bit of a dimple in the sides of those packing nuts. And that will give a mechanical retention on the end of the set screw more than just friction. So I'll be able to thread the set screws in to the where they're just touching. They're not compressing the gland nut, and it'll maintain the position of it. So there's the little dimple that I just made with the drill. And I'll thread that back in, and hopefully this will solve that problem. I also ran a reamer through these gland nuts and did a little bit of sanding on the outside of them, just in case there was some concentricity problems that was causing them to create drag on the piston rod. After those improvements, it's a lot better. It self-starts now, as you can see. The throttle is very jumpy because that air valve I'm using is very touchy. But it does self-start now, and it's running on noticeably less air. As you can see now, it's running on about 10 or 11 PSI, which is quite a bit better. Now that it's running better, though, I can hear the valve timing is not very good. It's not running what's called square in locomotive jargon. The valve events should be symmetrical to the ear. You should hear one chuff, then the other chuff kind of evenly spaced. So I decided my valve timing probably wasn't very good. I had done it carefully according to Kozo's method, but I thought I'd try it again with a different method. I found a video from a fellow called The Steam Doctor. I'll link to him down below. And he's got a different method for setting valve timing on Walshirt's valve gear that I really liked. It involves locating front and rear dead center on the drivers with a series of scribe marks on the crosshead. And then from there, you can set the return crank positions. And then from there, you can set the valve positions for the correct lead on the valves. And using his procedure, I found that actually the valve positions on both of my valves were out by about one turn on the valve spindle and my return cranks were both off by a couple of degrees. His method is a lot more time consuming, but it's quite a bit more rigorous in terms of making sure the valve timing is correct at both ends of the stroke, rather than just doing it at one end and assuming the other end will be okay, which is what Kozo's method does. And after that change, it's running much better. It's not perfect, at least to my ear, but it's definitely running a lot more square than it was. I believe that's probably as square as I can get it without modifying the valve. I suspect that one of my valves is not covering and uncovering the ports exactly the same as the other one, but that's pretty darn good, I think. I was still unhappy with how much pressure it was requiring, though, so the next thing I did is I took out the rings of, on the pistons, and I sanded down the pistons a little bit. And now, look at this. That is now running beautifully. It self-started like butter, and it's running much slower and more comfortably than it was. And it's using 
half again as much pressure as it was before. Look at this. That's running on as little as 4 PSI, which is fantastic. I could not be happier about that. I don't really know what the standards are for locomotives with model stationary engines. Below 10 PSI is considered good. Below 5 PSI is considered very good. So I'm really happy to see this running below 5. Of course, the rings and seals are there for a reason, so I do actually have to put them back in and try to make it run well with all the rings in place. I'm going to work on getting everything sealed up. The drawings call for O-ring seals on all of these gland packing nuts on the valve rods and the piston rods, but unfortunately installing O-rings means disassembling all of the valve gear to get to the far ends of all of these rods. And that is very difficult to do on this engine. It's a lot of tiny eclipse, and taking everything apart costs you your piston calibration and your valve timing settings. So instead, I'm going to use Teflon cord, which is the modern version of graphited yarn. I've had very good success running this stuff on model engines. If you do it right, you won't have any leaks at all, and you don't have to disassemble the engine to install it and or replace it when it wears out. Now the goal is to get that to seal without creating extra drag on the mechanism, or at least not much extra drag. That feels pretty good. Okay, here we go again with all the rings and seals back in it. Throttle's still very touchy. And that's running pretty well. I mean, it's using more air than I would like. It's running on about 9 PSI here, but it's got all the rings and seals in it. It's using a lot less volume of air now as well. My compressor can almost keep up with it. This is a very tiny compressor, mind you, but uh, it's almost able to keep up with the engine now, which is good. So I would say I'm moderately happy with this. Uh, there's still more tuning to be done on this. I did also fix a couple of air leaks. One of the steam chests was leaking where it meets the cylinder, so I pulled that apart, cleaned everything off with acetone, and reapplied the sealant in between those. And I think everything is pretty leak-free. I've got one valve gland there that's still leaking, as you can see, but otherwise pretty good. Now this is all on compressed air, mind you. When you put steam in one of these things, you will find all new leaks that you had no idea were there. Steam is pernicious stuff, and yeah, you'll feel pretty good about yourself on air, and then you put steam in it and find out you're terrible at life. All that said, I'm fairly happy with how it's running right now. As I said, it's running on about 9 PSI. I'd like to be a little lower, so there will probably be more fiddling in the future, but it's running well enough that I think we can move on with the build. You never stop fiddling with a steam engine trying to make it run a little better, leak a little less, and so on. It's a hobby, not a task. That's, that's why we love it, right? Well, thank you so much for watching. I hope you were as excited as I was to see this thing run on air for the first time. Pretty soon we'll get it running under its own power, which is going to be a whole other, much more exciting event. But this was pretty neat. Thanks for watching. Thanks to my patrons for making this happen. And I'll see you next time.